I don't want to go to any student funerals this year. I don't want to go to any teacher funerals this year. It's a struggle to, you know, be trying to work, but then also have your child there and trying to make sure they're, they're getting their work done and they're learning. I am absolutely unwilling to lose an entire school year for any of our kids. But unfortunately, many districts are recognizing that the rate of transmission is not where we would hope it to be to allow full-scale uh, uh, insight or on-site instruction. You want to be safe. I mean, there's a virus out. Kids, class, and coronavirus. What parents need to know. A Coin6 Town Hall. And good evening, everybody. Welcome to our Town Hall. Kids, class, and coronavirus. What parents need to know. I'm Jeff Giannola. And I'm Dan Tilkin. For the next hour, we'll be answering questions submitted by you, parents and students and teachers, about the upcoming school year. Tonight, we are joined live for the panel of school superintendents from across our area who are here to address your concerns. Now our guests are Guadalupe Guerrero from Portland Public Schools, Christy Perry of Salem Kaiser, Don Grotting with Beaverton School District, and Mark Molino from Evergreen Public Schools. And thank you all for joining us tonight. So this is certainly a rapidly changing situation. When we started working on this project, uh, parents were still uh, looking at choosing an in-person or, or at-home learning, and now we know the students in our area will be starting the school year online. Now, you all share a passion for our students' education, and Superintendent Guerrero, tonight, let's start with you. How difficult has this whole process been coming to terms with the health and safety risk of in-person classes and then trying to shape an online model that could really have a long-term impact on our children? Good evening. Thank you for having us. Uh, I, I, there's a little comfort knowing that um, I, I share this challenge with many of my colleagues, uh, some of whom are joining us here this evening. We're going to be continue to be guided by that, making sure that the health uh, and safety of our students, uh, our educators, our employees, um, that has to come first. Thankfully, we're we're in Oregon. We're we're uh, we're paying attention to those things. Uh, uh, we have worked uh, and collaborated with the governor's office to ensure that there there's some metrics and some some health guideposts to help uh, inform our decisions. Uh, I know that many of us are uh, working closely with our public health authorities and, and gathered medical experts. Uh, we have to make decisions uh, that are informed by by the best data available, and we know there will be some variability. But as a school system, uh, nothing motivates us like making sure that. Uh, we're doing our best to to comply with our core mission and that's making sure that there's a continuity of learning for our students and therein lies the challenge uh, when we have to make decisions that uh, our campuses simply can't guarantee safety at this time so uh, how do we switch up that delivery model well we live in a fascinating area because we have two states right next to right. each other both trying to figure this out so let's go to mike merlino from evergreen uh, let's talk about the state of Washington. The same question to you. How do you go about uh, making, make, trying to come up with a plan that takes care of the health and safety and also tries to educate these kids? Yeah, I think I think uh, I would say the same thing as Guadalupe. We are fortunate to have a lot of folks in Clark County working together. Uh, we have our superintendents, I think, have worked quite well together trying to do exactly what is happening in Oregon follow the uh, guidelines that were provided by OSPI, by the state of Washington. We worked really closely with the Department of Health. I think uh, for Evergreen, our, our uh, priority, our goal from uh, late May, June was to try to come up with a plan that provided the opportunity for our, our students to be in school uh, on site, either in a hybrid model or full time. And uh, it's ab absolutely, though with the safety of our students and our staff uh, at the forefront. And we really kind of work, uh, worked hard at that, but unfortunately just the, the uh, level of growth of cases throughout Washington State, uh, throughout the country really, but even in Clark, even in Clark County, um, led us, uh, our states kind of changed the metrics a little bit, even in the, just the last few days, where we're looking more heavily at the uh, um, cases per 100,000 and uh, so, uh, unfortunately, we kind of had ended up at this spot with the remote learning. We want to have our kids on site, but I'm happy to say that the work that's gone on within the district with our, our administrative staff on building the plan with our teachers input, 
Uh, we're feeling uh, very comfortable with where we're at as we continue to work on the plan, uh, it, that it's much improved from last spring where we were kind of thrown somewhat to the wolves uh, overnight. Uh, and even in that situation, I think we did really well. But certainly, like everyone else is going to say, the safety of everyone is at the forefront of uh, where we're at. Hey, Mike, thank you. Let's get to some questions from our viewers. And our first question, this was submitted by a parent. How is online learning going to be different than in the spring? You just heard Mike said it was sort of like you all were thrown, thrown to the to wolves. The wolves right? Yeah. So how will kids and parents be supported with online learning resources as we begin a school year? And Don, I think I'll go to you in the Beaverton School District. Yeah, thank, thank you for the question. Once again, a shout out to COIN for, for having us here. I believe when we started uh, online learning in the spring, we were really just struggling to find out what it was. We were worried about connectivity for our students, devices in our students' hands. And we've had time since spring and now even over the summer to where we're really reaching out, making sure that our students are going to be connected, devices are going to be there. And then also providing our teachers the resources that they need to be able to reach out to their students and also looking at wraparound services that each one of our students need. And that really needs to be differentiated. So I believe we are going to be in a lot better position uh, and our teachers are going to be better trained. We've had some times to really reach out to our parents, to our students, to our staff with surveys and find out what went well, but more so, where do we need to improve? And we've really learned a lot uh, from those surveys and reaching out. So I believe when we come back, our instruction is going to be better. We're going to have better wraparound services, especially for our most vulnerable students. And we're going to go forward. Yes, there will still be challenges. And the only last thing I want to say is, you know, we've always wanted to say, you know, Parents are their teacher, are their uh, students' first teacher. Right now, we need uh, the help of their parents and other guardians more than ever in helping us uh, provide the best education that we can for each and every student in each one of our districts. If we could ask uh, Christy from uh, Salem Kaiser, uh, there's going to be a lot of folks who are good at this and a lot of folks who aren't good at this. How do you begin providing resources to people who are struggling, whether it's the parent? Or whether it's the student. Right, so um, we learned a lot um, last uh, spring with how to support parents. And one of the things we've done is we've got a couple, we've had a couple programs this summer. For example, um, our migrant families, uh, we have uh, about 634 students in a virtual uh, migrant summer school this summer and one of the things we really worked on out of our migrant office was to build relationships with parents to help parents and support them in being their first teachers and then be sure that they were equipped with an adult that could they could ask questions to and that relationship would endure beyond the summer school so that's um one example um our teachers did a lot of that teaching with parents uh, last spring as well so we think our teachers are coming in more equipped because they were thrown or our parents are coming in more equipped because they were thrown into this like we were thrown into this and so um that's how we'll continue is to really just work on uh, supporting our parents. We did some surveying of our parents and a couple things they told us. One is uh, we need a common um, learning management system. We can't be um, on Google Classrooms and on something else. And so we will have a common um, learning management system for every student and their family, grades three through 12. Um, our younger kids have a different one. Um, they also said too many classes. So we are doing uh, fewer classes in shorter chunks of time in order to support students with um, not as many things to manage and so we can go deeper into uh, learning okay thank you for that uh, here's another question submitted by a parent so how will children meet their grade level what will the benchmarks be by the end of the school year using this distance learning model you know a lot of parents say are there going to be grades mm -hmm. a lot of parents say no that's unfair and how and do I you think, grade and how do you grade them and how do you grade them in guadalupe that's a tough one i think i'll, I'll go to you with portland public schools I like how you prefaced it. It's a tough one, so we'll send it to Portland. Uh, I think it's a question that we're all contending with. If, if what we're interested in is maintaining that continuity of learning, 
and we believe that the teaching should be standards based, there's a certain set of grade level expectations we have for our students, whether they're on campus or they're learning during comprehensive distance learning at this time. So uh, this morning I heard clearly as we welcome back our principals that they're anxious to, to reconnect with our students. I know that our educators are as well. We're gonna take a couple of weeks to make sure that they have that opportunity to reconnect, to assess what the real needs are. And I also wanna acknowledge uh, this isn't just about the coronavirus pandemic. There's an accompanying economic crisis and let's not forget uh, a, a growing racial uprising. And so there are several factors that as school system leaders we're, we're contending with. Uh, and so how do we make time in the schedule as we bring back our students, uh, even if that's virtually right now, to make time for those conversations and be clear, as Christy said, about what learning platforms and digital resources we'll be using, and then really sort out into some schedules so that we're, we're able to really dive into that grade level content. Um, I think we all expect to be able to, 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 to begin to dig into. Mm -hmm. And now let's go to the state of Washington, Mike Merlino. Let's get perspective on you because we have these two different dynamics yeah, two here. Same question to you, benchmarks and how you gauge them and grading, et cetera. Yeah, so I, I think uh, this is probably one difference in the plan uh, as we come back in the fall. Uh, I'm, not, I'm not aware of how it was handled in Oregon, but in Washington, when schools were closed in the spring, uh, basically it was announced right from the beginning that grading was uh, suspended, grading, grades were frozen at that point in time. Districts were allowed to determine um, kind of the grading scale, but not... Uh, um, it, students couldn't go backwards. They could go forwards, but they couldn't go backwards, which was some what of a, a disincentive for ki for kids to stay connected. Uh, I think our uh, plan going forward is the first thing we need to do is we need to connect with every kid, every student in, in our in our system. Um, I, I think our parents uh, want to know what is different about our plan in uh, 2.0 from what it is in 1.0, and I think we can't really rely on parents to. Um, go to even these types of, of forum. I think it's great we're doing this, but we 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 want to start day one with our students uh, hitting hitting the ground running. So uh, Don talked about technology. We're working hard now, making certain certain that every student's got their technology with them day one. And uh, I, again, I'm 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 very uh, pleased with the work that our curriculum department has done in building these new schedules. We're still finalizing them. Our board will approve our plan for the state of Washington uh, reopening plan next week. So um, I, I think there'll be more to come next week. But I, I think first of all, first of all, the fact that we we will have a grading system in place is significant. Uh, we are expecting kids to advance. I think you can't, uh, I think it's pretty widely accepted that you can't get to the level of content online that you can in person. So a lot of the work that we're doing is looking at the, the state guidelines and trying to make sure that we're hitting the the most important things uh, as we do our work. But um, like all of us are facing, uh, every day is a new challenge. And, uh, and I'm real happy with the staff that we have and making sure that we're taking care of that. Mike, you said something interesting about making connections. And one of the major things that kids are really missing during the pandemic is that connection, the play and socialization with kids their age. I mean, that's and a very important part of school. Yeah, whatever age group. Yeah. And that situation is likely to continue with the online learning. Uh, we talked with two local behavioral health experts about the impacts and strategies for parents. The first thing I think of is that kids are just, we're all social animals and kids even more so, and they're gonna miss their peers and they're gonna, and their friends and, and trying to find ways for them to connect uh, with, uh, their peers. Play is hugely important. If developmentally we don't let these children experience each other in safe ways, if we don't let them play with each other in groups and have those developmental pieces of feedback that help them figure out this is who you are and this is who I am, there's a whole other level of developmental damage that can occur for children. It's going to be really important to connect with other parents who are doing the same thing so that you can begin to develop some online socialization groups. Maybe families can pair up or team up or, and, and be able to get their families together, to get the kids together while practicing social distance, uh, physical distancing 
and uh, mask wearing and hand sanitizer, all those things to, to decrease and mitigate the risk. Maybe we have a lunch meeting together once a week where we all get together on Zoom and we eat our lunch together. Um, whatever it is that we can do to encourage as much socialization with people who are going through the same thing is going to be really super helpful. So we're going to have to change some of the things that we think about screen time and about social media if we're going to help this generation adapt. It's fascinating. Yeah. Okay, uh, there's been a lot of talk in our community about learning pods, maybe micro schools to help kids with socialization and help working parents. So how do you feel about these options is the question, and will your district help parents connect with others? How about, uh, this is kind of like a game of Hollywood Squares. So yeah. Let's go to uh, Don Grotting with Beaverton if you'd like to answer that question. Yeah, thank you. Um, so we understand that parents desire to provide additional supervision, especially the desire of working parents, uh, and they certainly have the right to do that. And we want to accommodate that as much as possible. We also know that we have some families that may not have the means to be able to provide this type of additional supports for their students. So as a school district, we're trying to find out how we can possibly repurpose some of our staff to provide some of those supports to, to children that do not have the means to do so and or parents to support parents. So reaching out, doing some parent support groups and really um, uh, focusing on those wraparound services that all of our kids need and some of those students need more wraparound services than other. So we have been really working with um, our city, our county, state stakeholders in trying to develop resources that we can bring that will make their distance learning experience better, but also when we eventually, hopefully, soon go back into a hybrid model, they'll still need those wraparound services. So uh, we support these type of strategies, but also we wanna make sure that each and every child has access to these strategies. And we do not wanna widen the disparities that Guadalupe already talked about. We already have great disparities. And one of our fears is when our students come back, uh, we're possibly even gonna see wider disparities. And how do we start closing that achievement gap and looking at language barriers, um, race, poverty in our school districts. Don makes a good point, and Christy, I think I'll come to you in the Salem-Kaiser district. He's saying the disparity, your district, what, 70% of the students at a, at a poverty rate there, and are you worried about the disparity when some parents get together and are able to hire teachers, and it leaves other parents who can't do that left out? Yeah, we are. That's high on our minds. We um, are really making sure we provide, you know, access, internet, but also counseling services. We've kept our counseling um, kind of warm line active all summer for our families. Um, we're already seeing this with families wanting to pull together music lessons for their kids, for those kind of who can afford. We um, have a project called the Music Lesson Project that we're going to really pay uh, close attention to. They support uh, families in poverty with uh, private music lesson when we're in person. So we want to now um, help support that virtually as well. Um, and just, um, again, that um, really intentional support. We have... Um, community outreach specialists that work with um, some groups of our kids, like our Islander community, our Native American community, um, our Black and African American community. And so uh, those positions in our district are going to be more important forever. And at the same time, all the social interactions. One of our really big pushes is around and biggest worries is around our youngest learners. And um, I'm proud of the fact that they're prioritized in our metrics, that when we have an exception to begin bringing kids back in, we, our youngest learners are prioritized as a high priority. Um, and you think about play, um, that's really um, critical. So we've done some small groups with our counselors and also um, some synchronous learning with teachers to help that developmental. So high on our minds, we're keeping our lunch programs going, food distribution from our food share um, is already planned through Christmas. I think they're serving or handing out a thousand or more um, boxes um, every week and that's set to go through December. 
We want to drill deeper on this, so we're going to take yeah. a quick break, though. But still to come, uh, kids, class, and coronavirus, what parents need to know, minorities and families who live below the poverty line have been some of the hardest hit in this pandemic. Along with special education students, they are the most vulnerable as we start the year online. And coming up, we'll talk about equality and how the districts are going to guarantee they don't miss out on their education.